Hello, my name's Vince Sheehan and today I'd like to talk about Bruckner's Ninth Symphony in D minor. I'd like to explore this great work taking a close look at the structure of each of the movements because I do believe that having some understanding of musical form can greatly aid our appreciation and enjoyment of classical music, particularly with a work as long and complex as a Bruckner symphony. Now, this work was left incomplete at Bruckner's death. He was working on the finale when he died. But what he completed, the first three movements, have uh, become what we regard as Bruckner's ninth. Uh, there are finished versions of the finale, uh, but I'm just going to concentrate on the first three movements in this video, the completed movements how it's most usually found on CD and in the concert hall. Bruckner started it in 1887, but uh, work on it was uh, halted when he went back and revised some of his earlier symphonies. And when he returned to working on it in 1891, Bruckner's health was deteriorating. He knew that this was likely to be his, his final symphony. and um, it was incredibly important to him. He dedicated it to God. It's very much a sense that this was the summit of his achievements. And he yearned to finish it before he died. Work in it was laboriously slow. Sometimes Bruckner was so ill, even putting a pen to paper was uh, beyond him. But eventually he finished the third movement, the Adagio in 1894. He started the finale in 1895. But that, as I've said already, was not completed. But Bruckner's Ninth, in its unfinished three-movement form, has got a wonderful symmetry to it. We have these two mighty outer movements with their um, profound utterances, and we have in the middle the much shorter, more direct and uh, somewhat frightening scherzo. It's almost like a triptych, which I think is very uh, apt, considering that this work is dedicated to God, and uh, of course how devout Bruckner was. Now, sadly, as with during his life, um, after he died, people were fiddling around with his music, and uh, the work became to be known, first of all, in a revision uh, by someone called Ferdinand Lerva. But it wasn't until 1932 that Bruckner's original version, how he left it, was performed. And it was somewhat of a revelation. And since that performance, its stature grew and until the piece we uh, love and revere today, despite its unfinished status. The first movement, as is always the case with Bruckner symphonies, is a gigantic sonata form movement. And um, it begins, like many of them do, with tremolo strings, a kind of humming, um, which of course is uh, inspired by Beethoven's Ninth, and uh, which of course is in D minor as well. And I don't think the parallel was lost on Bruckner. Um, but this symphony is such an unforgettable opening. The strings have this D. Woodwinds come in. The horns.
such an unforgettable opening, isn't it? Very interesting because Bruckner spells out D minor above those tremolo strings in the horns, outlying the triad. Just as we're settled in D minor, there's this wrench up a semitone to E flat. So already there's these uncertainties in the music, these, uh, these forces inherent in the music, trying to uh, steer us away from the certainty of the home key uh, at a very early stage. We then have these chromatic meanderings, um, first on the violins. Um, expressive descending oboe figures and then we get this new idea in the woodwinds etc. We have this scurrying idea then Before the music builds to an almighty climax, this time uh, in a thunderous fortissimo return to D minor. In typically Brucknerian fashion, the whole orchestra plays the same thing. shakingly powerful moment. We then have um, some descending pizzicato strings. And over the top of those pizzicatos we hear these, um, these snatches of uh, almost bird calls. Um, these uh, strained intervals on, in the woodwinds. Etc. So eventually this first subject group dies away. As is usual with Bruckner, there's a pause. I think we just hear the timpani and we're into the second subject group in A major sometimes called the Gazangs period. And um, we have this melody, which is kind of shared between the first and seconds. group of melodies and we come to this radiant mo moment, my favourite part in this second subject group, that's really romantic. We go into C major. We go back to that first idea, then this new triadic Configuration comes in the woodwinds. Dun, 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 which brings us to the third subject group, which is back in D minor. We have this.
And again we have these wide ranging intervals with this subsidiary idea. That builds to a climax and uh, we move into F major and uh, the, the exposition finishes. We're now into the development and the development begins as the, the first subject group began with these dotted rhythms. I love those little flickers there in flutes. We then come to that climax again as we did in the um, at the beginning. Uh, with a key shift, if you remember. Da, 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 etc. So we hear lots of the first subject here. We hear those um, snatches of bird calls, those rather um, odd intervals we heard in the uh, first subject group. <laughs> come to another fortissimo climax. We hear snatches of that third subject group tune again. Da, 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 da. We get round to the second subject and then we have this uh, build up. Something's going to happen and what happens is we hit D minor in the development. We've hit the home key and we're still in the development. Bruckner's done this before. He does it in his third symphony off the top of my head, I know that, also in D minor. And it's almost like a false recapitulation. The violins are blazing away going like this. And over the top we've got... stay in D minor we go up a key and the developmental nature carries on. We then hear a tune of a rather funeral like tread we hear these triplets and the recapitulation begins proper with a return to the second subject. The second subject group um, no need to do the first subject first we've heard it so much in the development, including reaching the tonic, and um, that's fairly straightforward. We hear the third subject again, and then we reach the coda. And Bruckner codas are wonderful, aren't they? We hear this tune from that triplet, da 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 da, da which comes uh, right of the first uh, subject group. Then we notice in the brass the music just swells unexpectedly, almost takes your breath away. Really wonderful moving moment. And then the elemental power of the first subject comes back to the fore. With this driving rhythm. Dum, da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum. Just unstoppable. And we have the bare fifths. of course recalls Beethoven's ninth again. We hear the fifth. B's and A's hear the
to a close to a mighty movement. With its grinding rhythms and jarring dissonances, the scherzo seems to presage the modern age. In terms of its structure, it's very simple, like uh, most scherzos, uh, including Bruckner's A, B, A, ternary form structure. But this one is a particularly dark example. It's music which is quite nightmarish, uh, in the outer sections anyway. We begin quietly with almost an intro to the main theme. We hear a uh, call to attention in the woodwinds. And we hear this tune in the first violins. The music seems to be reaching for something. And then lo and behold, that theme heard in the violins comes into its own with this, this demonic fortissimo climax. There's something very mechanical, impersonal, machine-like about this music. Something which, in a horrifying way, is unstoppable. And those dissonances are, are marvellous, aren't they? What a wonderful chord. Stravinsky would be proud of that. The music then dies down again and we hear this quaver figure. That kind of thing. With splinters of that um, over the top. We then got one of the most thrilling climaxes in the whole symphony. It's, just, it's one of my favourite moments in this work. Here we go. If there's ever music of a storm, this is it. Um, Absolutely marvellous. As is usual with um, Bruckner Scherzos, there's another part in the A section, if you like. The A section is in a mini ternary form of itself, which develops um, the ideas of the main theme. We go into the major mode, we hear the oboe playing this in a rather genial way in A major. Rhythm, da da dum dum dum, is uh, never far away. Sure enough, um, we go back to the demonic energy of the uh, of the main theme uh, before the music rages away, and uh, we're into the trio. Now the trio is interesting. The B section, we go to F sharp major, so from D minor to F sharp major, quite a, a switch. And unusually, the trio's faster than the scherzo. Usually it's more laid back, like a Lendler or something, Bruckner, but in this case, it goes even, it goes faster. Um, Schnell, there's this feathery lightness to the music, which is perhaps a quality you don't always associate with Bruckner. Um, listen out for those uh, those flutes there, they're like birds. Really great flute part here. We have another idea as well, uh, a bit slower, a bit more, more mournful. in this trio between the light fairy music if you like 
and that uh, slightly darker tube. And then of course we have a reprise of that hellish scherzo. The Adagio, the last in a great line of Bruckner's symphonic slow movements, is almost a movement that defies explanation. Um, and it takes a good few listens to this movement to really understand how it's put together. Um, this is uncompromising music. It's deeply profound and otherworldly music as well. As is often the case, book and the slow movements in the symphonies, they're made up of an alternation between two thematic groups, two main ideas. And what Bruckner does, particularly in his later symphonies, is each time an idea returns, it's developed. So there's this sonata form uh, principle, this development going on with each reprise of the ideas. And in some instances, and in certainly in the case of this adagio, new music even, and new themes and quotes from other works even make their way into each return to the, the material. The music is centred around E major. It, uh, that's certainly where it's heading by the end of the piece anyway. And we begin with the first group of ideas, which I call A. Um, we begin with this uh, idea on the first violins. So certain parallels with Mahler's ninth in the opening of this movement. Those first eight bars begin with torment, begin with, begin with a sickness, a searching, a yearning, Tristan-esque. But then, by the end of these seven or eight so bars, we've reached the heights of heaven. With that Dresden Amen, which Wagner used, of course, Bruckner's idol, so memorably in Parsifal. We're then back to the uncertainty of the opening with these figures in the cellos. And we hear this motif with um, these wide intervallic jumps. And then we come to this wall of noise. The whole orchestra plays this incredibly uh, loud passage. I don't know why, it always reminds me of Star Trek, that bit. <laughs> There's then this uh, mournful horn chorale, and the music then eventually takes us to the B section. We're in A-flat major now, and we have this tune. This more cosier uh, tune. And then we're back 
to the first group of ideas again. We're back to that swooping string idea. Etc. And then we come to this variation of one of the motifs in uh, the, this A group of ideas. That wide ranging idea, remember we heard it on the oboe before. And uh, we suddenly hear um, this kind of walking bass. And over the top we have uh, a variant on that that wide leap tune. This return to the A section culminates in that wall of sound climax again. The Star Trek thing, as I, as I, like, as I think of it. Um, before we go back to B again, as you'd expect. But Bruckner this time leaves out the main motif of B. Um, he goes into that second idea, the more cosy idea. We're back to A again. And by the way, the exact form of each of the movements is down below in the description. So if you're really listening to this music carefully, which I suggest you do, please check out the uh, description below. Um, particularly if you're following with a score, because I'll have the bar numbers there as well. Um, we then have um, the A section then kind of morphs into this passage based on the first motif. I think it always reminds me of the overture to Tannhäuser. And then we have this incredible moment, <laughs> which weirdly sounds very much like Vaughan Williams, the, um, the Fantasia on a theme of Thomas Tallis, which was written, well... Um, a good 20 years after this, I guess. Um, I don't know if Vaughan Williams had access to this score or, um, or knew the piece, but it's very similar. But it's an absolutely gorgeous moment in this, uh, in this work. such a beautiful moment in this work um, and if you don't know the Vaughan Williams Talis Fantasia check that out because there is a passage very similar to this it's very unusual eventually sure enough we go back to the B section again and this is really interesting Bruckner here starts with the melody the main melody from the B section this addition of this the semiquaver figure in the second violins it's all just um, a semitone flutter really that becomes more prominent as this section uh, progresses and Bruckner then completely jettisons any material uh, we've heard already we start to hear a quote from the uh, miserere of his D minor mass and you can't help but thinking here that Bruckner's letting go of, um, of life itself in a very musical way, letting go of the material um, he'd introduced already. It's very moving. Um, the music then builds to a climax which almost defies description. Again, it's like a wall of noise, this deafening dissonance at the end.
That last chord is particularly interesting. It's what's called a dominant 13th. <laughs> This is music of the cosmos, <laughs> music of the heavens, music which is fearless in its disregard of any conventions which may be in the way of what the composer wants. We then have a brief recap of some material from the A section before we come to an incredibly moving coda, perhaps more so because we know this is the final bars of Bruckner's last symphony um, but we finally reach E major after all this journeying and uncertainty and after all these cosmic eruptions and Bruckner takes this new idea from the reprise of the, the latest reprise of the B section that um, that semi quaver idea And we have this coda of absolute serenity. And what's so moving about this is that Bruckner brings in quotes from various works which were successes in his eyes, which the public actually appreciated. Remember, Bruckner was beset with humiliating premieres. And it's very moving to hear these works, which he felt proud to put his name to, including right at the end on the horns, a quote from the Seventh Symphony, with that marvellous first subject idea. And remember, that's in E major, isn't it? That brings this exquisite, incredibly moving and indescribably powerful symphony to a close. Yes, it's not what Bruckner intended, he intended the fourth movement, but as it stands with these three completed movements, it is a work of mastery and a work very much sums up the essence of the genius of Bruckner. I'd just like to thank Paul Wang and James Brockhurst, amongst others, for suggesting that I cover this uh, wonderful symphony. And if you have any suggestions or any other pieces you'd like me to look at more closely, please put them in the comments below. And of course, please click like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. Bye.